Hey, Mr. Bieber, I thought I'd... Just right. What is this, the metric system? Everybody, cease operations immediately. Hi, hey everybody. We're with the SWBI. We're here to conduct an investigation on this project. What you're doing here has been deemed illegal, and no one leaves until we're done with our investigation. Is that understood? Wait a minute. What is this? Let me see that. Listen, we're from the SWBI, okay? Under the CSWE 84-3, this operation shut down until further notice. Wait, stop him! Oh, jeepers. Are we done playing around here? Okay, the more you cooperate, the quicker we'll be done. Let's get started here. Mr. Hook, please state your full name and your role on this project. My name is Chase Ryan Hook, and um, I'm responsible for, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm on the mechanical design team, and I'm responsible for uh, designing the cockpit mm -hmm. and um, the flight controls. Okay. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. When I was 12 years old, I stole a pack of gum from Maverick. Sorry, sorry, I'm a little nervous. That's fine. So... Tell me more about what specifically are you designing with the aircraft? So the first thing I was assigned to do is create the flight controls. So on the joystick, we wanted to make it very comfortable and ergonomic. Um, previously, to get the texture on the flight control, we would physically have to draw in the features to get the texture. Now, I can take a 2D image and actually create the texture itself without having to actually model every single feature to create the texture that we're looking for. That sounds like it'd be a lot faster than before. Absolutely. It's expedited the performance on the model as well as the time it takes to actually create the texture for the finished component. So these flight controls look pretty complex. How do you guys go about designing those? So myself, I actually like to design at the part level. Um, previously, we would have to actually take this into an assembly in the software to run an interference detection. Now, we've modified the software so we can do interference detection at the part level which saves me a lot of time. So when you do detect these interferences, how do you deal with that? Previously, at the assembly level, we would have to move components around to create the clearances that we needed. Or we would actually have to put a fillet or a chamfer along the entire edge where the two pieces interfered. Now, I can actually do a partial fillet or chamfer just in that section and create the clearances that we need. So the pilot's flight controls look very futuristic. How did you guys go about creating that? So the shape of the joystick is actually created by another group of our design team. And we bring that mesh into our software where I can use my slicing technology to create the profiles that allow me to create a surface that is much more manufacturable. So with the flight controls and even the pilot seat, they're very futuristic shapes and they're of a different material. How did you guys actually produce those? So the material is actually plastic and we had to invent a new technology called injection molding. Injection molding is actually shooting molten plastic into steel molds at very high pressures to create those organic shapes. The process is very reliable, however, it's very, very expensive. I mean, I remember the first mold that I messed up, I thought I lost the budget for this entire project. So, I wanted to make sure that that never happened again. So we invented a software that allows us to actually simulate the entire injection molding process from when I shoot the, the plastic all the way to when it's cooling down and deforming. Recently, we added new features that allow us to add boundary conditions based off the geometry of the part. This allows us to add control valves, gate locations, refine the mesh, as well as control the wall temperature, which gives us much more control over the process. So the flight control housing, that looks like that sheet metal, is that right? Yes, sir. Tell me about how you guys are designing those components. So like you said, they are typical sheet metal components. However, using a new feature in our software called tab and slot, 
we create self fixturing assemblies. We can now do unequal offsets on the tabs, as well as new corner treatments, which allow for more flexibility in manufacturing. Mr. Hook, I think that's all we need from you today. Mr. Hook, you, you can go now. I've got to admit it. I'm the one that didn't fill the coffee pot. Mr. Hook, that's all we need. And I'm the one stealing all the toilet paper from the bathrooms. We'll let your supervisor know. Now, now please leave. Weird. What do you... What, what do you think is going on in there? Is it finally going to happen? Are, are they going to take us away? I mean, prison's not a place for me, man. I mean, I had nothing to do with this project. I actually had everything to do with this project, but... Yeah, we're all going to jail. Mr. Fink, is it? That's correct. Mr. Fink, go ahead and state your full name and your role on this project. Aaron Andrew Fink. I'm the project manager. So as the project manager, you know where all the data stores, is that right? Of course I do. I built the systems that manage the data. I built a data management system. It all began with what we called PDM, or product data management. Now PDM is where we store all of our file and CAD data. It does the revision control, the workflow. It stores all of our metadata. But the problem is we've had a lot of outside contractors on this project. Not everybody's in the building. So we came up with what we call the web portal. The web portal allows people from outside the company to access our data within the company. Recent developments have enabled our CAD designers to be even more effective. Now the web portal allows us to download entire relative folder paths and keep all of the CAD data managed locally in the way that our teams are used to managing it when they're in the building. So is everybody on this project working with this PDM system? That's the intent. All of our mechanical, our manufacturing, our electrical, our uh, quality inspection teams are all working together in one system on the same design files. Look, Mr. Fink, we need to know where everything's at, okay? It, if you're storing stuff outside of this system, I need okay. to... What do you take us for? Amateurs? We realize that not all product data is file-based CAD information, okay? On top of PDM, I've developed a new system that manages the complete item master record. It does all of the process and project management. It has task assignments. It is capable of doing business intelligence dashboarding and reporting. Look, we're keeping the entire product record in one place, I assure you. That sounds familiar. This sounds like, I think, PL... What? I call it manage. Okay, manage. Well, it sounds like this PDM and this manage system you've developed are really impressive tools. So help me understand this. Who do you have to report to to get us more money? Mr. Fink, that's not exactly how this is going to work, but I do appreciate your time today. Thank you. Where's the next one? Uh, he's already here. What do you mean he's already here? He's on the screen. So you're here from the government, and you're here to help. Right. And all I need to do is cooperate and tell you everything. You see, down here in the manufacturing area, we have to take whatever craziness the engineers throw at us, and we have to make something that actually works. I mean, more than half the time, we can't even understand what they want. I mean, just look at these drawings that they send us. I mean, they're all blue and white, and you can't read anything. So me and the team, we got together, and we figured out a better way to communicate our designs. We call it model-based definition. And we've been doing it here for a few years, and, uh, but this last version really lets us do some pretty cool stuff with, with sheet metals. We can come in here and we can do things like bend notes on the model and show a flat pattern. And we can even show a bend table and have all that captured in our MBD. See all those notes and dimensions? We call that PMI, which stands for Product Manufacturing Information. And that's the most important part of MBD. So I can spin it around here on the tablet. We can walk around on the shop floor and show anyone that needs to see the designs and all the notes and dimensions are all right there. So we changed the name of some of the tabs here in the program. We shortened this one to 
just MBD. And this other one here used to be called Dim Expert. Now we call it MBD Dimensions. So one of the other things that we had to do with MBD is to take and make a secure PDF file. It's got to be password protected. You know, we have the option of showing only the graphics instead of the model data too. We use this when we need to show somebody what we're doing, but we don't want to give them the whole kit and caboodle. But that password allows us to lock down who can see the data or edit the options. Don't you think MBD is a lot easier to understand than these old style drawings? Yeah, me too. So here's another program we developed to get our jobs done easier. We call it inspection. Every time we make a part, the engineers and quality guys want to make sure we did it right. And they love their documentation. Have you guys been to see Aaron when he's talking about PDM and manage it? <laughs> there I go sharing too much again. So back to inspection. We need a way to tell the machinists and the inspectors what is important. So we make these reports that have all the dimensions and notes that need to be checked. And I was having to hand write or type these things and that takes way too much time. So we made inspection and now I can do this in a few seconds. I can pull properties from the model or from the drawing and I can have them right here inside my project. We have this grid here on the left that shows all the characteristics and it's a really easy to read list. We can use this MBD data over with something called Control X. That's our metrology software. We can take scan data and lay it right on top of that MBD data with that PMI inside. And all those colors let us know whether this thing's within tolerance, whether it's out of tolerance, maybe we need to take another swath at it, but it lets us know if we've passed. And that's where we put in our projects. I reckon I've given you about all I can for my area. If I think of anything else, I'll just send it right over. Mr. Grubbs, would you go ahead and state your name and your role here on this project for the cameras? Uh, you probably already know it, but it's Timothy Grubbs, two Bs. Thank you, Mr. Grubbs. Would you please tell us what is it that you do on this project? Listen, you know the project, bub. I keep it secret. It's a secret. I keep these secrets secret from other secrets, daddy-o. Okay, let's move on. I keep hearing rumors about a barn. What is it about a barn that you're doing? Oh, catching on quick, huh? We're building a flying saucer. Where do you think we're gonna hide it? We're just gonna leave it out in the open? No, put it in a barn. You know that though. I thought you guys were smart. You've probably been listening anyway. So you're building a barn, is that right? <sighs> I'm not building a barn, I'm designing a barn. Others build it. So how are you communicating with them to build the barn without giving them everything? Listen. They have their programs, we have ours. I just need to export it in an AEC file so they can read it in their programs, like Revit and whatever else they have. So you're designing the barn then, is that right? Do I look like I designed the barn, bub? No, you wanna to talk to Mr. Vega. That's who you wanna to talk to. So Mr. Vega is who has designed the barn? This room's too small for an echo. Yes, can I get out of here? Mr. Grubbs, I think that's all I need from you. Thank you. Keep your mouths closed, everybody. Snitches get stitches. Hey, uh, go ahead and grab that guy that uh, Mr. Grubbs was talking about. Hello, how's it going? So please state your name and your role on this project. Uh, I'm Eric Vega, I'm the uh, structural engineer. Okay, Mr. Vega, I've heard about a barn. Tell me about this barn. So, it's not just any barn. I mean, this barn is hiding a flying saucer, you know, and Designing it, it was a job. It was a job before, actually. It's become a lot easier now. I used to actually have to sketch every single location for every one of the components that I had to use to make this thing. But no longer is that the case. Now I can actually use, use to find planes, existing connections, existing, uh, existing supports to just have it all connect together for me. I do not have to draw each one of them anymore. So before I had to take care of every one of the connection points, every time those weldments would get in touch with each other, but no longer is that the case. Now I can actually control the entire feature with just one simple set. I tell it how I want it miter cut, and it does it all throughout. No more work on my side.
And the best part is now I don't have to go search through all the features if I have to modify anything. It's just only in one simple feature. So it sounds like you're able to design these structures a lot faster than you used to. Oh yeah, it easily cuts the time in half. I mean, it kind of leaves me with a lot of free time on my hands. I knew it! Go ahead and state your name and your role in this project. Uh, I'm Ron Grover. I'm the, the communications guy in the project. So communications, does that mean instructions and work documents, things like that? Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Okay, tell me a little bit about how that goes around here. So before I came along, the engineers would just take pictures and they'd draw sketches, things that a kid could do. Mm -hmm. But I created a tool where I could take their engineering files and I could compose images and animations that would then convey their ideas and instructions to the people that are building this thing. So when you create your documents, you have to add all of your own manufacturing information to those? No, not at all. I can now bring in the 3D PMI from the engineering team directly into my documentation. So all of these documents that you're creating, where do you store all of those? Well, it's important that I move the documents along with the project, so I'm storing them in the data management system. I created a way to seamlessly integrate into that system so that as the project gets revisioned, my documents will move along with it. So earlier I saw some photographs of some of the designs you're working on, but I don't think those designs have even been manufactured yet. How are you guys creating those photos? Those aren't photographs, those are renderings. Explain what you mean by renderings. So engineers used to just have gray blocky images of their designs. They were horrible. I created a tool that allowed us to have photorealistic renderings of our designs so we could visualize them before they were built. So that might explain something. I saw what appeared to be a film earlier of the spacecraft actually landing. Was that something you had to do with? Yeah, I can now incorporate the laws of physics directly into my animations, or what you call films, to show exactly how the craft would land or how any other vehicle might move for that matter. That, that's amazing. I could have sworn I was looking at an actual film. How is it that you're able to make this look so realistic? So I, I added the ability to use material definition library and physically based rendering materials in my animations and images. So I get realistic textures and realistic colors make things look even more real. So how are you able to get this done so fast? So these used to take forever to do. And then I created the denoiser tool and now I can create renderings and animations that take a fraction of the time and look better than ever before. That's all the questions I have for you Mr. Grover. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, nothing. Gentlemen, please state your name and occupation for the camera. My name is Tyler Reed. I'm the shop foreman here. I'm a Taurus, I'm not a Russian spy, and I've climbed the seven summits. Just to be clear here, you know you can't lie to us, right? I understand that. Let's just say I'm here to supervise. That being said, it's 8 a.m. Why are your hands so dirty? I oil my toast. My doctor says it's good for digestion. You got a problem with that? Uh, tell us about your role in the Flying Saucer Project. So all the engineers upstairs use CAD for the design and simulation, but they have tools I don't need. They give me a simpler version that's more manufacturing oriented. I have CAM, but that's about it. I can open parts and assemblies, but no 2D drawings. So what's that exactly? Listen, it's real skookum. All of the designers upstairs are using the 3D models for the tolerances, and my CAM tool can read those. So let's say a turbine shaft has an OD tolerance that's tighter than Steve's belt strap. My cam tool takes care of it for me. It reads that tolerance and changes the feeds and speeds, the depth of cut, the number of passes, all that jazz. And it gets it chooch into 100,000 ripums, no problem at all. Easily 100,000 ripums. No drawings? How does that work? Ugh. Like the man said, he uses the 3D model. Are you of the hearing impaired? 
maybe we should slow this down for him. So I heard rumor that there's some sort of layered manufacturing process that you guys have. Tell me about that. Well, I call them replicators, but guys like Steve call them 3D printers. Basically, they fabric cobble shapes without any need for cam, tools, setups. I created 24 of these little doodads in about three days. And not only did I not need cam, I didn't even need me. You know what I did? I sat down and watched Twilight Zone for three days while these things were being made. I like to call that binge watching. One of these days you'll understand. So what are these made of? These things are made of 17.4 pH stainless steel. It's a type of metal, if you're not familiar. We used to pour these, now we grow them. Ever since we got this system, it's been the fabricator especial for any parts that need to be metal. So you're printing polymers as well, is that correct? One word, plastique. Even the Twilight Zone writers couldn't come up with the things our scientists have made for us. This material here, it's called Ultim. We use it for just about everything in the saucer interior. Ducting, Ultim. Cup holders, Ultim. The reason we use it, it's strong, and we can get it hotter than a $2 pistol and it just doesn't burn. What he's basically saying is that Ultim is safe for flight ready parts. We operate outside of the government's regulation, but we still want our pilots to be safe. Ultim has passed the burn-related regulations codified under the Title 14 of the CFR. It's kind of like asbestos, but uh, without the side effects. And we know that because we put our safety squints on and tested it. <laughs> they call this miracle material peck. I think it's because it's stronger than a woodpecker's lips. The Pixie Wranglers love it, because it blocks electricity. We pump dinosaur squeezins through the center all day and it never gets chowdered. We're able to pass fuels through this part and also provide electrical isolation. This material has very strong properties as well as high chemical resistance. This last material here has the best bendy to weight ratio. It's the 12th blend of nylon with bits of chopped carbon fiber added to boost the chooch factor tremendously. We use it for lightweight tooling and functional prototypes. I like to call it Nylon 12 CF. It's made up of 35% chopped carbon fiber, which gives it the strongest stiffness to weight ratio. We use it extensively. So these are all thermoplastics. Are you guys working with anything else? Of course we do, brother. Some of my best work is done with our futon plastics. He means photons. It's a light cured resin, a photopolymer if you would. We use these for fit checks, small complex parts with small features, and for parts that I like to call persuaders. Persuaders are photorealistic models that we use to show our ideas to some of the VIPs and upper management that can't think past a picture. You see, the government people don't know what we're doing down here. And I tell them, but they don't understand. So instead, I created this. It's a perfect full color replica of our metal frisbee. I show them this and they get it. We can print in over 500,000 different colors. While this project was mostly monochromatic, the possibilities are limitless. Some even say that we'll be able to use these parts in moving pictures. Done it. This is supposed to be a secret, but since you brought it up, a few weeks back, took some hot snot and attached the string to this little doodad. Stole my kids' colored wax sticks, painted a beautiful backdrop. What I did was make a tape of this thing flying in front of it. Marked that tape top secret. Gave it to a couple of friends of mine. Real whack jobs. Here's the thing, though. If they believe it, nobody else will. Hmm, that's genius. I'm surprised you have children, and I don't know how you work here. But misinformation, disinformation? My CIA buddies are going to find that very interesting. I made the Roswell tape too. Uh, cut the tape, cut the tape. Okay, go ahead and send in the next one.
Okay, go ahead and state your name and uh, your role on this project for the cameras. My name is John Lieber, and I am really uh, the electrical engineer, which basically means I'm the only one that actually knows what they're doing. Please don't touch. Okay. Tell me, what is it that we have here in front of us? Well, ultimately, what I've been able to do is take this crap that the mechanical engineers came up with before I joined the team into this. Okay. Well, tell me a little bit about how you've done that. What, what's going on here exactly? Well, the first thing I want to talk about is just all the wires and connectors. I've created a tool that actually allows me to create my schematics in such a way that they let the mechanical team can actually read and be able to put together the schematic or the uh, products exactly how I drew them by including things like zigzag connectors to say, hey, you know, this is actually a large connector with multiple connection points, even though that they're drawn across multiple sheets in my schematic. Oh, I get it. So you make the wires, you design the wires. No, actually, what I do is I have tools that allow me to diagram exactly how those wires are supposed to be put together so that even the mechanical engineers can figure out how two wires get twisted together and put things like splices and inline connectors. And then when they flatten it, I don't really think about the things of uh, how wires are labeled but there's new tools that they've developed that actually allows them to define a fixed length label that defines, uh, that tells them what, what the wire number is or where the, uh, the, that wire is actually supposed to be connected to. So even the mechanical engineers can actually wire these things up without having to stop and ask me what to do. Okay, so you give them the information they need so they can make the wires. What do they do after that? What can you do with that? Well, they've actually created new tools that allow them to leverage the intelligence that I've placed into my database in their 3D application, which simply allows them to leverage everything that I've done in their tools that makes their job easier and it stops them from having to, again, keep bothering me. I see. So it seems like you keep the electrical and the mechanical side very separate, which is what you'd prefer. Absolutely. Okay. Is there any way that you guys, I mean, I'm assuming you must be able to collaborate somehow though, because of a project like this, you must be able to work together. Well, what I've done is I've actually created a way for me to, to take the, the, the product's data in my tools and directly integrate or synchronize into the tools they're using so that all the information about the project, such as the schematic sheets, my part numbers, mm -hmm. and then I can just really leave it up to them so that if something goes out of, out of production or it's no longer available, mm -hmm. they can do a simple where use type of command and find out what schematics or what boards or wherever and simply replace those parts on their end mm -hmm. so we don't actually have to communicate because every time I communicate with them, it just frustrates me. Okay, so that makes sense for the wires and so forth, but tell me about these little green... Okay. Sorry. Tell me about these little green things. What are these? These are called printed circuit boards, or as I like to call them, PCBs. PCB, okay. And ultimately, what we were having to do before was I would create the PCB, and it would just be elegant and I have exactly how everything was supposed to be, and then I create a DXF or something and send it over to the mechanical team, and then they literally take their crayons and write all over the DXF, move this hole, change the location of this component, which just created a lot of work for me because I wouldn't know exactly where I'm supposed to move the hole or where I'm supposed to move the component. Now, they can actually move those components or move a hole and then push that information back to me, which allows me to actually see, okay, how those changes are going to affect the layout of my PCB, the traces, all that information. And I, we can actually communicate without actually having to communicate or talk to each other. Okay, so you can send over basically the outline and the general shape of the PCB board? To... No, no, no. So actually what... what, what so I've spent a lot of time to make this beautiful layout. I mean, it just, it's elegant. 
and it has things like what the name of the component is, where the traces are, where the test points are, information that's actually really important to them, I can actually push that directly over to the mechanical team so that they can see, well, for one, how nice the board actually looks and how good I am at my job, but they know if they move something or if they put a hole there, they're gonna cover up my, my, my design. And now they'll actually be able to see what's there, not just the shape of the board and where the components are, but all of the information that I've placed into there so diligently. Well, this has all been very fascinating, Mr. Lieber. Um, I think that's all we need today. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you, and it's, it's truly amazing to have someone that can truly appreciate the work that I've done here. Yes, thank you. What is going on here? I've got all my engineers out there doing nothing. Who are you, and what is this all about? We're from the SWBI, okay? We'll be the ones asking the questions. Now tell me, who are you, and what is it that you do here? My name is Ami Megani, and I'm the Director of Engineering. I'm ultimately responsible for making sure this whole thing works. So what does that mean? What are you doing here with this? So that means I've got to go through all their designs, all their prints. I've got to redline their drawings and mark up with feedback so that they can make it correct. That seems like that would take a lot of time. It takes forever. That's why I was in my office all this time. I've tried to come up with a better solution for this so that I can mark up the 3D model directly on the screen. I use the 3D markup tool as a collaboration tool and to provide feedback to my engineers. Using a touch-enabled device, I can insert the markup view. I can also select the pen color and the thickness style simply by moving the slider. These markups are stored with the model and the orientation. You can edit or add to any markup simply by accessing the markup folder. I can also export the markups to a PDF, bitmap, PNG, or JPEG format. So explain what you mean by touch screen. What does that mean exactly? Look, I don't have time to explain everything to you. I have work to do. We're done here. Ma'am, I'm not done asking questions. We need to talk a little bit more about what you're doing. Right, Mr. Williams, you still here? So, Mr. Salyer, is it? Am I saying that right? Yes. Can you can you please state your full name for the record? It's uh, Cody Salyer. It says it on my desk. You know, the one you brought me from. Okay. Thank thank you. Um, so, go ahead. Tell me specifically about what is it that you're doing on this project. So, I'm working on how to make the process better. Right. So, we have a way we design things, and we needed to make that work better for our engineers. So, in the home screen, we have the ability to open recent documents. We've made the tweak now that I can not only search through my recent documents, but I can also sort through parts or assemblies, and I can view top level, similar to if I was opening a document. And then once I get that open, how do I interact with it? So we have this ability to use what we call breadcrumbs to see things about the file. The problem is, is we have really big screens, and you know that's a lot of travel time where I have to remember a shortcut. Uh, we didn't like that idea. So the new idea was it could just always be where I'm clicking and I could get that important functionality no matter where I go. So you, you say you work on really large files. What, what is it that you guys are doing to help improve that part of it? Large, that's the only word that comes to mind. This is huge. It's groundbreaking. And you should know that. I mean, you kicked in our door. <sighs> yeah, we did some changes to handle that. So we historically have had a tool called Large Design Review that allowed us to, you know, look at these large assemblies. But the problem was it was kind of just like a really big picture. I could see anything, but I couldn't interact with it. See, I decided I wanted to pull something out. Tough luck. Well, now we decided to change that. I can add components. I can remove components. I can add mates. I can basically assemble all my components in large design review, have access to you know the enhanced performance, and put together my assembly. But there was some times where you have to resolve those assemblies. And we decided we also should leverage some of the things we learned in enhancing that. So our GPUs on our computers. Just the letters GPU? Yes, GPU, Graphics Processing Unit. Okay, okay. That makes the pretty pictures on the screen. 
Anyway, our program didn't utilize enough of that. So we optimized it so it would use quite a bit more. Now when we're working with large assemblies, it's much smoother. We'd have fewer dropped frames. It's easier to work with the model. Now in working with the model, we also noticed one other uh, small thing. Most of the time, if I'm making a, a mate or I'm in a command, I will need to know how far two things are apart, right? If I'm saying this needs to be you know, X distance away from a wall, what is the distance? I need to make a measurement. So I have to stop what I'm doing to go take a measurement. Well, now we can actually just make measurements while I'm in a command. So if I'm extruding a shape, I can just leave that there and go take a measurement to see how far I need to make it without ever having to leave that command. Interesting. So we're, we're going to need access to these files for our records. Um, do you have clearance to put these in your records? These files are classified. Does that make sense to you? One of the things we've worked on also has to do with defeature. So understand that sometimes I need to send my files to um, a vendor or another user, maybe someone who I don't want to have access to that proprietary information. I can strip out some of that detail using defeature. So I can go through and use bounding boxes and generic shapes to represent the geometry. And so they can get the general idea or size of what I'm working on, but they don't see the details, obviously. So as you guys are communicating these, these complex components, what are some of the techniques you guys use right now? Okay, so um, a really easy way to show like assembly of these components is I explode it. Like explode. Explode it? You yeah. Yes, I explode it. It's called an exploded view. I pull it apart. Why am I talking to you? Anyway, we worked on the exploded view feature inside of the program. So now all my steps to take it apart I can set them up as steps to take it apart. I can roll back to previous ones. I can rearrange them. Now I can just easily set up that exploded view for my users. Now I can use that in a drawing or a document. Um, for you guys, um, the video format might be a little easier because then you can just watch this screen. Um, so we also added a whole bunch of new uh, ways to export that, such as Flash or MP4. So now you can get your animations on well, your screen so you can watch them. Okay, Mr. Seller, I think that's all that we need from you. Thanks. Really? That's it? Do you even understand what I told you? Like, to be frank... Listen, Hank Aaron, I'm going to take your large assemblies and knock them out of the park the next Tuesday if you don't quit the lip. I'm, I'm going to go. The, door, the door's open. Right this way, sir. <laughs> right this way. Thank, thank you, Mr. Seller. All right, please state your name. Uh, uh, okay, okay. I think I know what's going on here. I can tell you guys are smart like me. So I'll cut you in on the action right now. I don't know what you're talking about. What? The government, they're never going to support manned space flight. You know it. I know it. Heck, even Tony Stark knows it, and he's just a comic book character. So while the rest of the engineering team has been hard at work designing the spacecraft, making sure it's structurally sound and flight worthy, blah, 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 blah. We know that realistically, we eventually have to sell this thing. And nobody wants to buy a generic spacecraft these days. Here, take a look. I've built up a catalog of configurable spaceship options based upon the data the engineering team has been working from. I can zoom, rotate, and get real-time updates based on my selections. The publisher add-in from within our design tool allows me to easily upload our CAD geometry directly to the cell platform and build a digital catalog of designs, options, and material considerations. It's then possible for us to take that and integrate it with e-commerce platforms and let the likes of Howard Hughes and Bill Boeing purchase our ships directly online. Let me show you how this works. I can group my assemblies by materials during the upload to make it easier to provide material options to the end customer. I can even use a sketch point in my model to identify attachment points allowing me to build in the appropriate intelligence when switching between our various engine components. Now, I'm not a web programmer, but I can easily set up my template and define space on the page for parts, materials, options, and various other controls. 
all of the rendering happens dynamically in the cloud, so we don't have to waste our time generating thousands of images in advance. And I made sure that all of our IP is secure, because Cell automatically converts our native CAD to OBJ, so our trade secrets stay safe. Cell lets us leverage our engineering assets to pitch design ideas internally and even sell our configured product catalog online. What do you say? You guys can get in on the ground floor right now. All right, all right. I think we've heard enough. I think it's time for you to go. No, we're, we're on the verge of the next... Mr. McCracken. We're, no, no, no. We're on the verge of the next Mississippi. Thank you for your time. It's going to be... Oh, never mind. It'll be too tough to sell anyways. Whew. Glad this chair has wheels. Can you believe that guy trying to sell the flying saucer? I mean, he seemed pretty desperate. I bet you we could get a good deal. <laughs> Probably. Go ahead and let the next one in. Yes, sir. What do you have the books for? Ah. Okay. Sir, please state your name and your role on this project. Hey, man. Level with me here. Am, am, am I going to jail after this? Is, is, that, is that what you want my name for? Sir, please just answer the question. Okay. My name is Aruna Chalam Theravian. Aruna Chalam. Just call me Arun. Arun? Okay, let's go with that. Tell me, what is it you do on this project? So I run the test lab here at this facility. I was just out in the test lab. I don't see any equipment anywhere. <laughs> equipment? You mean test equipment? What, what is this, the 1920s? We, we do all our testing inside computers. What do you mean that you do the testing in the computer? Let's... Take flow simulation, for instance. It's a computational fluid dynamics tool, computational fluid dynamics okay. CFD. So w what it does is it uh, helps us tackle all the airflow and thermal performance problems in the aircraft so we can come up with a shape so it can dissipate heat fast and it can, it can take flight and essentially stay there. Uh, we've even had to build some new tools to you know, help us tackle some of the bigger problems with the aircraft. Tell me about these new tools. Okay, so, so we have these six engines, right, that's essentially sucking in air from the environment. Now, all the vanes that are built around the aircraft that essentially brings in the air, we want to make sure the mass flow rate through all of this is constant, so, or equal, so that the air aircraft is balanced. So what we're able to do with the software now is we're able to take surface parameters off of section planes. So we took a whole bunch of section planes across all these vents to ensure that the airflow through these vents are constant. So you mentioned the heat with the pilot. What is it that you're doing for that? So, so the pilot's just a guy, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's sitting right above an engine. There are about six engines around him. There's a lot of heat getting into the cockpit area. Now, we want to make sure that enough heat is be being dissipated from the cockpit area through the glass. And now, with our flow simulation tool, we can study heat flux off of transparent surfaces. Now, the enhancements don't end there. We, we, we want more. So what? we developed was the ability to see the entire heat flux schematic of the aircraft. What does this mean? We know what is the heat source and we know what the heat sink is. So we are actually able to build efficient cooling system that tackle the prominent form of heat transfer through these heat flux schematics. So tell me, how are you doing structural testing? So we have this finite element analysis software, FAA finite element analysis, yeah, called a simulation that is a completely built into the, uh, the engineering design program. So as soon as the engineers create the design, we're able to immediately test for the structural strength of the component, much like the flow simulation. Now, uh, what we were able to design with it was how the substructure was built to make sure that it uh, has a really high flexural strength to both pressure and thrust loading. Yeah. Now, the tool, tool is great. It has all the features that we need to accomplish this analysis, but we wanted something to make it run faster. So we built a whole bunch of enhancements into it. Uh, for example, remote loading. Now, remote loading is a convenient way by which you can replace uh, a majority of the components uh, in your assembly to just run the analysis on what's necessary. For instance, in this case, the substructure. Now, new for remote loading is we can build in coupling functions that enable relative rotation between all the substructure components that were selected. So that gave us a better understanding of the flexural strength of the substructure. So previously, we were actually underpredicting the strength of it. Um, okay. Now, keeping with the theme of speed, we also have 
had this load case manager tool that helps us run multiple load cases within the same static study so that the software doesn't have to mesh over and over again for every case that we'd like to run. Now we made a whole bunch of solver improvements in this year that helps us uh, run load cases faster and this has been tested to up to 25 load cases for a single static study and we are able to run much faster than we, we ever were. So with these tools that you have, how are you guys able to create these futuristic shapes and designs I'm seeing? Futuristic, you say? It's, come on, man, it's 1959. We're at the cutting edge. I'll give you two words, topology study. So in the analysis talk software that we spoke about earlier, simulation, um, we built in a tool last year called topology optimization that helps us create these intelligent designs through uh, by, from the analysis side. So instead of actually tackling uh, the design of components from the napkin sketch stages, we use the software to give us shapes based on the kind of forces and external loads that these shapes experience. So what we get is an optimized component that, can, uh, that has the minimum amount of material, but that has the maximum stiffness for a given material. Now, this was great and all, but since we're actually designing a spacecraft, and there's a lot of vibration loads. For instance, the ramjet spins between 1,000 RPM to about 20,000 RPM. We want to make sure that the final shape that was designed was able to take all these vibration co conditions. So what we built in was our ability to put in frequency constraints. So that takes into account the frequency of the final optimized shape to make sure that it's over the range that we need it to be. So it doesn't shake the component till it breaks. Hmm. In addition to that, we also have factor of safety constraints. So, of course, you know, after we get these design shapes, we need to uh, test them in the software again to make sure that the final shape that the software proposes works. But right now, we can gain additional confidence by putting in those constraints during the analysis phase. So we can put in a factor of safety that then gives you a shape that adds enough material so that it's strong enough for a certain type of material used. So let me get this straight. You're taking the testing inputs and results and having that create the design rather than the other way around. Exactly. Tackle the problem from the source. Interesting. Well, that's all I think I need from you today. Thank you. So, so what's it going to be, man? Uh, am I going to jail after this? Is, is that what's no. happening here? Where are the cops? Uh, Mr. Roon, just go way outside with the others. Okay. And take your books with you. So is that everybody? Yep, that's the whole team. All right, let's go ahead and make the call to Waltham. You got it. Well, did we get what we needed? Yes, sir. Yeah, we got more from these flying saucer weirdos than I think any of us imagined. Great, bring all that information back to Waltham. We'll get this all packaged up. Uh, sir, I, I don't think we can do that. Why not? Well, what we uncovered here, it's, it's incredible. It's like nothing we've ever seen. That's a good thing, right? Yes, but maybe too much of a good thing. The tools and the programs that they've created here, they're so advanced, I don't think the general population is ready for this. So what are you suggesting? We need to delay the release of this. For how long? At least 60, 70 years, maybe more. 60 years? That puts us out to 2019? I know, sir. And even then, this will still be groundbreaking. Fine. We'll reschedule it for a 2019 release. Now get back to Waltham. Yes, sir, Mr. Solrix. Right away. Well, let's pack up, head back to headquarters at Waltham. Dude.